This is the story of a valley, its history and its people. This is the story of the Pine Rivers Valley, which lies in southeast Queensland and follows a crescent that runs from the tip of the Dagula Range in the west to the waters of Moreton Bay in the east. This is also the story of the Pine Rivers Shire and the rapidly developing valley we know today. The natural boundaries of this shire have ensured through time that this region retains its individual character, its own unique and largely rural personality, reflecting its past and for the most part separating it still from the surrounding urban sprawl. As the name suggests, our story begins along a river. Long before that river became known as the Pine, its banks and the surrounding wilderness were home to a number of Aboriginal tribes. From the dream time they had lived by the river, roaming from the ranges to the sea, through forest and shrub and grassland, to hunt and to gather and to trade. It seems that the Shire's earliest inhabitants were several Aboriginal clans belonging to the Turbal, Gubby Gubby and Waka Waka language groups. They came together very often especially at times of feasting on the popular Bunya nuts on the Blackhall Range and the Bunya Mountains. There are well-established pathways to this day linking places of significance. From this pathway, the, uh, the Aborigines used to go straight down this ridge, down to the uh, bottom of the valley, Sanford Valley, then across to where approximately the uh, Upper Camp Mountain Road comes into uh, Upper Camp Mountain and just down in that area there was permanent springs. Although they were nomadic, the Aborigines did establish permanent sites for their art and for burial. There were ceremonial borer rings at Samford, Sampsonvale, Debra, Mount Pleasant, Lacey's Creek and Petrie. The Samford ring has been faithfully preserved to this day. This ground was belonged to the family from about 1865. In the 1870s they used to hear the uh, Aboriginals with their corroborees in the ring here because they lived just on the ridge on the other side of the road. And um, they um, said that you know, they never had any problems at all because they all respected each other and uh, the Aborigines were quite friendly and so they got on very well. Relations between the Aboriginal people and those who came to explore and to settle here did not always run smooth. There were crimes committed and lives taken on both sides. There were, equally, many examples of good relationships and even close friendships. The greatest impact by far of the collision between these two cultures was felt by the Aborigines. The two centuries of our story began with the arrivals first of James Cook and then Matthew Flinders. Each sailed by Moreton Bay in the late 18th century and gave to many places we know to this day their English names, but not to the Pine River. The river flowed on uncharted until the 1820s came along, when John Oxley led a party to navigate the river in search of a suitable site for a convict settlement. Captain James Cook had sailed no closer to the coast in 1770 than the passage between Morton and Stradbroke Islands. This piece of water he called Morton Bay. A journal at the time records just how close he came to finding the river of our story. About 10 a.m. we were abreast of a large bay, the bottom of which was out of sight. The sea in this place suddenly changed from its usual transparency to a dirty clay colour, appearing much as if charged with freshers, from whence I was led to conclude that the bottom of the bay might open into a larger river. Joseph Banks, Thursday, 17th May, 1770. Almost 30 years passed before Matthew Flinders sailed in. He charted the coastline of the mainland as well as the islands without discovering any of the three major rivers flowing into the bay. 
Again, a journal entry reveals an unexplored clue to the existence of a river that would one day become known as the Pine. From Redcliffe Point, we pulled over to a green head about two miles to the westward, round which the bite is contracted into a river-like form, but the greatest part of it is dry at low water. Matthew Flinders, Wednesday, 17th July, 1799. For another 24 years, the river flowed on, and little changed but the seasons. The next explorers to enter our story were not, in fact, explorers at all. They were Thomas Pamphlet, Richard Parsons and John Finnegan, and they were lost. They were very lost. They had left Sydney Cove in the April of 1823, bound south for Illawarra, to collect a cargo of timber that were blown off course by a severe storm and were shipwrecked far to the north on Morton Island. Then, thinking they were yet south of Sydney, they headed north, back as they thought, to civilization. They rounded Cape Morton, crossed south to Stradbroke and reached the mainland by way of Peel Island at about the point where Raby Bay is today. Then they walked north again until they reached the wide expanse of a river mouth and had to track upstream for a crossing. This they found where we now know Oxley Creek. On what we now know, as the Brisbane River. To cross this river and follow it to the sea, they borrowed canoes, which they found on the banks. They continued north, and not until they came to Hayes Inlet, near the mouth of the Pine River, did the owners of these canoes object. It seems they'd eventually taken one that was filled with fish. The Aborigines gave chase, but when they saw the miserable condition of these three men, they gave them the fish, caught more, and took the travellers back to their camp. Again in 1823, in November of that year, His Majesty's cutter Mermaid sailed into Morton Bay and anchored near Point Skirvish, which is now Bribey Island, on Pummiston Passage, which they knew then as the Pummistone River. On board the Mermaid was John Oxley, the Surveyor General, and one can only imagine his surprise when he was greeted at Point Skirmish by Pamphlet and Finnegan. The two had travelled as far north as Noosa with Parsons, who had remained in that area and so wouldn't be rescued for another year. What most interested Oxley was the fact that Pamphlet and Finnegan spoke of having crossed large rivers on their travels. So on Monday 1st December 1823, Oxley set off with Finnegan as a guide to search for the largest of these rivers. Instead, Finnegan mistakenly led him into Hayes Inlet, near the very mouth of the Pine. But Oxley was later to refer to this find as the Deception River. Finding the stream had its source in swamps and not from the mountains, did not pursue it further. Where we left off, the water was brackish, and there were a great many very fine cypresses. Ascended a small hill on the right of good soil, saw the stream had a weir across a little higher up. Much good timber of the eucalyptus species, with she-oak and dogwood. The natives are very numerous on the shores of this inlet, and came down in great numbers, trying all methods in their power to induce us to land, waving green boughs, holding up their necklaces, etc. Several waded off to the boat, to whom we gave biscuit, which they ate. John Oxley, December 1823. Oxley would later amend this entry in his diary, changing cypresses to pines. The small hill that Oxley refers to is today the John Oxley Reserve. It has been suggested that the weir he speaks of was in fact a fish trap. No matter, unimpressed, Oxley moves on and eventually will find the Brisbane River. But that's another story. Our river, now dubbed the Deception, flows on. John Oxley's purpose had been to survey sites for a convict settlement. His recommendation for a penal station at Redcliffe Point and then at a river site was accepted. He returned aboard the Amity to establish the Morton Bay Penal Settlement. Thus opened another chapter in the life of the Pine River and its surrounds, because in 1824, in the company of the government botanist Mr. Alan Cunningham, John Oxley returned to the point he had reached on the river to gather samples of the local pine. Spars of this timber, later to be called the hoop pine, they brought back to Sydney on the Amity. The Pine River, having earlier been called the Deception, the Blind, and briefly but more pleasantly the Eden, was eventually named after the Hoop Pine, 
that grew so abundantly along its banks. Well, look at that beautiful tree. It must be 30 metres, maybe 40 metres to the first branch. And look, its girth is what? Well, I can't reach round it. The visit of Oxley and Cunningham to our river in 1824 led to the timber industry, one of the earliest industries to be established in the region. During that period, when a convict settlement was located at Redcliffe, the search began for softwoods in the area. The timbers they discovered were highly thought of. From what is known of the Brisbane, the Blind and the Pumice Stone, they abound with the finest timber that has hitherto been found in New South Wales. Several ships of this last year have been principally loaded with it on their home voyage. Edmund Lockyer, 1825. Lockyer, of course, spoke of New South Wales since the state of Queensland was yet to be. Early settlers first cut timber for building their homes before clearing the land for agriculture. Professional timber cutters followed. As early as 1847, there is record of an attack by natives upon three timber cutters two of whom died. Also in 1847, the first vessel built in Moreton Bay, the Salina, was launched and once rigged and finished, set off up the Pine River to load a cargo of cedar locks. Sadly, on her maiden voyage to Sydney town, she was lost and all hands perished at sea. The wreck of the Salina was found a year later, washed up on the beach at Keppel Bay on the central Queensland coast, far to the north. At the time, cutting timber on freehold land was permissible anywhere. One needed a license only to cut timber on crown land. The system led to ill feeling out of early competition. The problem was that where one team of timber cutters would blaze a trail to the pick of the timber, another would simply follow that trail to grab their timber from the same vicinity. Typical of the earliest pioneers of the timber trade was James Wynne, the first of a family of timber cutters who would continue with the task into a fourth generation. James was a fairly enterprising young fellow, we think, because uh, he quickly got established into the timber industry, probably looking uh, north of Brisbane to supply the uh, burgeoning Brisbane market with uh, cedar, beech, pine, most, more particularly pine in this uh, pine shire, uh, was full of uh, good hoop pine. Cutting timber was never easy. Before the establishment of sawmills, Sawyers, as they were called, camped where they found timber and dug a pit nearby deep enough for a man to stand in. Over this they built a platform onto which the logs were rolled. When all was prepared, two men at a time would go to work with the saw, with one on top of the log and the other, the less fortunate Sawyer, in the pit and under a cloud of sawdust. Transporting the timber was no easier task. Teams of up to 20 bullocks were yoked to a timber wagon and hauled their load often all the way to Brisbane wherever the terrain on the way made it possible. Little wonder, perhaps, that the Australian bulletin gained such a reputation for colourful language. Bad roads, steep grades and hairpin bends made the going extremely dangerous. The river, of course, remained the major means of starting the timber on its way to its markets. And it was bullocks that hauled the logs to the river. Certainly, he was involved in rafting timber uh, down the pine the North Pine particularly, uh, from rafting grounds in Affleck's property down here and further down near uh, what is now Sweeney's Reserve. And in fact, there's the remains of a, of a rafting, one of the old rafting slipways at uh, Sweeney's Reserve. The logs were then taken or floated down the river on a high tide uh, out to Dolly's Rocks where they were retrieved and hooked together and uh, waiting on a suitable tide to, uh, to be uh, towed around out, to, out across the bay and uh, up the Risen River on a suitable in, uh, flow tide into Pettigrew Sawmill. The era of the Bullock teams continued until World War II, when it ended quite abruptly. Together with their colourful handlers, they passed into history almost overnight. Yes, well that there photo of my father's Bullock team and that single log load is about the proudest possession I now have. It was my father's method of getting his living by timber cutting and then 
bringing the logs into Samford railway yard to go to Brisbane to be sawn up to build Brisbane's houses. Solid tyre trucks came along in the 1920s, but even then the likes of George Reynolds would call on Charlie Patrick to send Bill Dawson with the Bullock team to help them down the steep slope from Jolly's Lookout to Highvale. Timber was plentiful throughout the area and was in use for many purposes for many years, as it is today. There were many families involved in the timber industry through those years and included among them were the Nicklin brothers. Um, my parents came here in 1937 and uh, that was their start in the industry. And he, he commenced logging with a bullock team and then graduated to uh, the winder. And one winder in particular had 2,000 odd feet of rope on it. Um, that was the process for a number of years. And then by 1950, um, the brother and I became involved in the timber industry and from then on, uh, we did contract snigging and hauling and cutting. Um, uh, with, uh, by that time we'd purchased um, a cat crawler tractor with a logging winch and then we graduated to a D6 crawler and winches and, um, and used them for the, for the next 20 or so years. The main pathway between the Woodford area and Brisbane, passing through the Pine River Valley, was established by the Archer Brothers. In 1841 they had arrived in the Brisbane Valley from the Darling Downs and had settled near Woodford. Their first journey that year to the settlement, as Brisbane was known, was through the Brisbane Valley to the Dray Road from the Downs at Ipswich, very much the long way round. Andrew Petrie was the first free settler appointed to the Morton Bay Penal Settlement, where he was superintendent of government works. But if this was his role, his far greater preference was for exploration. He roved far and wide in the region, ostensibly searching for building materials, and so travelled where no other European had ever been. He was the first to bring back samples of the bunya pine. On these journeys, he was often accompanied by his young son, Tom, who had been encouraged to mix freely with the Aboriginal people and had learned the Turbal language. In no small way, Tom's acceptance by the Aborigines and the knowledge this brought him must have assisted both Andrew Petrie and those who later followed in their explorations of the area. Through all of these years, the Pine River flowed on. The Aboriginal people continued in their ways and only the occasional passerby came to observe the timeless scheme of things. Some crossed the river wherever it was not too wide, but no one had yet stayed to settle in this valley. There were reasons for this. Chief amongst them was the fact that the penal settlement restricted zone prohibited expansion into the Pine Rivers Valley. In February of 1842, however, a proclamation was issued. It read, all settlers and other free persons shall be at liberty to proceed thither in like manner as to any other part of the colony. Although there had been some surveying done earlier in preparation for free settlement, it was Francis Griffin who in 1843 became the first free settler to occupy Pine River's land. He established the Whiteside Run on the north bank of the North Pine River and was soon joined by other members of his family. In the following year, William Joyner and William Mason took up a run on the south side of the river and named it Sampsonvale, after Mount Sampson, which was and is the highest peak on the Dagula Range. One of the descendants of William Joyner is Graham Joyner. The property was originally acquired in 1844. There has been some conjecture as to who was here first, the Griffins or the Joyners. I'm pretty sure it was the Griffins, and I'm quite happy not to argue about it. Uh, curiously enough, after several years, some quite few years after great-grandfather was drowned, Isabella married John Griffin and uh, it was run mutually. I think they all lived at Samson Vale. Originally it was a, a run, it was never surveyed to my knowledge. Subsequently it was a crown lease, said to have been 20 square miles, 12,800 acres. I don't know the boundaries of that and when it got down to the preemptive purchase, of course the freehold boundaries are easy to define, but what it was in the beginning, nobody knows. And what it is now, 
a lot of people don't know either. So there we are. Almost all of the area now occupied by the Pine River Shire was divided between the Whiteside and Sampsonvale runs. And it was not until the mid-1850s that the Samford run on the upper reaches of the South Pine was taken up. Thomas Petrie, the son of Andrew Petrie, who was the first free settler in the Brisbane area, would eventually establish a holding of 10 sections of land purchased from the Griffins. These formed the Marumba Run. Tom Petrie, a well-renowned early settler, would live here until his death in 1910. During the 1850s, in response to the many new arrivals clamouring for land, the New South Wales government began to survey blocks suitable for more intensive farming. Eventually, land sales were held in Sydney. The sales included that land outside the present boundaries of the Pine River Shire, in an area to be known as the Bald Hills Farms Subdivision. There were many, however, who simply moved on to any land where no run had yet been established. These squatters hoped that they would be able to establish tenure at some later stage, and many did. One of these, who had moved on to the land in the Pine Rivers region around 1850, was James Cash. A decade later, he would become the first freehold landowner in the area. Queensland's separation from New South Wales in 1859, with its proclamation as a separate self-governing colony, brought about legislative changes that were directly involved with the area. The primary consideration was availability of land. The third of the provisions of the Land Code of Queensland had a major impact on the Pine Rivers region. It provided for the immediate subdivision of a large portion of land on the shores and navigable waters of Moreton Bay to be surveyed and opened for selection as agricultural farms. Since these selections were advertised throughout Australia and overseas, and immigrants were assisted with their purchase in the new colony, many were attracted to the area by the prospect of affordable, accessible land. Closer settlement thus began in the Pine Rivers Valley in 1862. 1868 was to bring about a major change in the nature of the settlement of the area. The Crown Lands Alienation Act was passed. This provided for the resumption of at least half of those leased areas that had made up the major runs. The land thus freed was available for free selection. And of course the prime areas of Whiteside and Sampsonvale were soon subdivided and occupied. The conditions of the time were that um to avoid uh, speculators and the rich taking up all this land, uh, they had to occupy it for four years, or at least six months of every year in four years, and uh, make certain improvements. At the end of that period, uh, if they could prove that they had filled these uh, conditions, they were able to buy the land for two and sixpence an acre. So grandfather bought portion 26 for two and sixpence an acre and, um, and then so we became established in Sampsonvale. This was a busy time in the life of the Pine River Valley. Smaller holdings meant closer settlement. With the grazing areas so greatly reduced, small crop farming and dairying became prosperous pursuits for many. Timber getting too increased and prospered. With all this prosperity and closer settlement, the social life of the area came into bloom. There were agricultural shows where competition was friendly but fierce. The Lawton Show it was one of the biggest things there were, the Lawton Show. When it was coming up to the Friday for the Lawton Show, everybody would be busy making new clothes, so everybody had to have a new outfit to go to the Lawton Show. And those days it was really a good show, but um, it used to have trotting and everything, but they don't have that anymore. But, um, I don't think there's near the people go there, that what, even though there weren't many of us, but I worked there for a long time after, when we got older, we used to work in the kitchen and help cook the meals in the kitchen or make the sandwiches, and um, Charlie used to, and my brothers used to work on the wood chopping. So, um, you know, we used to put quite a few things into the, into the show. Everybody used to do their knitting or sewing or writing or something like that and put it into the show, but it wasn't as big as it is today, but to us it was a better show. You know. Community halls sprang up where lively dances were held. Those dances, um, they were a real 
real good time thing for the people, you know, after working on the farm. But what happened with that? Uh, <laughs> he used to watch uh, blokes about, or 15 or 16 young fellas, you know, working on the farm, really shy blokes, a bush shy. And they'd come Saturday night, you know, they'd have their Saturday bath and put a bit of Johnson's baby powder under the arms and slick down the hair with Californian poppy or a brilliantine and slick it down and they'd pay their way in and then they'd just stand outside the door all day, all night and watch, uh, watch all the dancers. Now they'd have something to talk about then for the next month. Uh, they'd reckon they'd had a good time. Uh, but everybody um, joined in and helped. Churches, at first shared by several religions, were built. So too were schools. There were picnics and sporting events. The Iceman travelled door to door, as did the veggie cart. And with the groceries came bags of lollies for the children of these new communities around the valleys of the Pine River, while the river flowed on. As we have seen, the earliest roads in the area were opened up as people crossed the South Pine at Cash's Crossing and the North Pine at Gordon's and Young's Crossings. Road access to the region was very limited. Then came gold. As was the case in so many places around the world in these times, the discovery of gold at Gympie in 1867 brought about rapid changes. By the following year, a coastal route to Gympie carried horse-drawn Cobb & Co coaches, bringing passengers and mail along newly formed roads through the Pine River Valley. My father had the Cobb & Co from Petrie Station to Debra, and with the mail and co passengers too. And then he also had the mail run to Whiteside on horseback from Petrie Station to Whiteside. Here, Tom Petrie re-enters our story because the Petrie homestead on Marumba was the point for Cobb & Co's first change of horses after leaving Brisbane. A hostelry and mail office was established here, and this was the beginning of the North Pine Township. It would later be called by the name we know it today, Petrie. The railway to North Pine was opened in 1888. There were stations at Strathpine and Lawton, serving the eastern areas of the Shire. The service through the western areas would wait until 1918 for a station at Samford and until 1920 for one at Debra. However, this line was closed beyond Fernie Grove in 1955. The river of our story, meanwhile, did not always make its way so placidly to the sea. It could become very angry, and it did in 1931. This was the year of the big flood. The 1931 flood, it was to me, worse than the 1974 flood because it came up and it was lapping the girders of the of the railway bridge and uh, the waves in the river they were they were easily three foot high and uh, i can recall uh, we were at home and of course it was right up around our house stumps lapping our back steps By now, the Pine River had been well and truly awakened to the presence of the world beyond its valleys. Drive down Spitfire Avenue in Strathpine today, and you will be driving down a road that was once a part of the main runway of a World War II airfield. In the early 1940s, the population of this area exploded, with the arrival of several squadrons of Australian and Allied airmen, including the joint RAF and RAAF Spitfire squadrons 548 and 549. These were formed at Strathpine, where many types of aircraft were to be seen during the conflict. They were eventually posted to Darwin and would fight the war in the islands to our north. I'm Alan Lowe. I was here in uh, 1943 with the uh, 548 Spitfire Squadron. I was a flight mechanic, which meant that I looked after the engines. Uh, when we were here, this area was very, very sparse of any houses or any, it was all uh, mainly open and treed areas. Uh, the Spitfires used to land in the direction through there. There was nothing out there for a half a mile because they came in very low.
I can't get over how the area has now become built in. The Americans too arrived in the area in great numbers in the form of the 1st Cavalry Division of the United States Army. 15,000 troops were housed at Camp Strathpine. This camp stretched out from Crimsow Road at Warner to the North Pine River at Young's Crossing, then spread northeast across Debra Road into Petrie, through what is now the French's Forest Estate. To understand the impact of the war on the South Pine region, consider that its local population at that time was just some 4,800 people. It is estimated that the number of troops who were stationed in the area through that time exceeded 50,000. It's quite natural that such a massive invasion was not always appreciated by the local people. Such phrases as lock up your daughters came into the language. However, hardly a soul could fail to be impressed by technology and sheer speed of construction such as they had never seen before. Reticulated water, for example, was provided in seemingly no time and for the first time ever in the area. The other airmen, they were quite nice. They used to march through the property, down to the big gravel pit that was on the river bank down there, and they used to train down there. And they used to have tracer bullets, and they used to use the tracer bullets. They used to bring the big bullseye down. Peter would go down. He was about the only one who could use the gun. And, and Kruger's lived over the river, and um, he used to farm behind the mangroves. And the next thing you'd hear him roaring out about the tracer bullets and telling them to keep the bullets at heart on that side of the river. Yeah, you could see the bullets flying. Following the departure of the American troops in 43 and 44, Camp Strathpine was occupied by various units of the Australian 7th Division, 2nd AIF. After the war, most of the buildings of this showcase military facility were sold at auction and removed, so that today hardly a trace remains of this dramatic episode in the life of the Pine River Valley. But the river, of course, flowed on. For a short time after the Second World War, the Pine River Valley settled again into being a peaceful rural scene. But again, change was not too far away. And it was industry that so rapidly brought about that change. There had been industry here before, Timber, of course, and the Launton Cornflower and Starch Mill, and cane fields and sugar mills for a while. It gave rise to a distillery that was said to have produced some of the finest rum in this or any other land. But then, in 1957, Australian Paper Manufacturers Limited, APM, opened at Petrie. So, concentrated on the North Pine area. And uh, a friend of mine, was Nim Love, Wild Love, and we made Nim our uh, real estate agent, and he set to work getting buying land up there. He called it Operation Mukau, that was our security. Nobody knew we were buying it, nobody really knew much about us at all, fortunately. So, APM had been quietly buying land for pine plantations for some considerable time. But now, with the opening of this mill, it would stimulate the economy and increase the population of the area quite dramatically. We never, and the whole time I was with the company, we never advertised for labour once. We always had it waiting at the doorstep. Before APM, Petrie was no more than a contented farming town of 20 or so houses two stores and a hotel. Petrie was uh, a, a town, was a country town. It was, they uh, had cattle and horses in the street. A lot of people had milking cows, chooks in the backyard, and horses running the street. And it was a, it was a country town, even though it was only 17 miles from, uh, from Brisbane. And uh, life was, you know, it was just like a country town. Uh, now it became a busy company town, growing steadily as its population grew. Then in the late 1950s, Sidling Creek was dammed to create Lake Kawangba. This provided the reticulated water supply that would further encourage growth in the region. Residential subdivisions so common today were just becoming familiar. Along Gympie Road, this progress was highly visible beginning to change the simple outlines of the Shire to the background of houses and businesses we see there today. 
After the Second World War, many successful industries provided employment and led to the growing urbanisation and prosperity of the area. These included PGH Brickworks, the Australian Match Manufacturing Company, cable makers, Namco Furniture, Chesney Caravans and Crop Care amongst others, some of whom have moved or closed and some of whom remain. In 1983, the expansion of retailing in the area culminated in the opening of Westfield Shopping Town. The Pine River continued to flow onto the bay, but not quite as it always had, because by the mid-1970s the waters of the North Pine had been dammed to create a large man-made body of water. This is called Lake Sampsonvale. It was named in memory of the historic property that now rests substantially beneath its waters. The construction of the dam was not without criticism, nor cost in human emotions. Still feel cheated as I did then. But just here on my right, this is the sawmill and Uncle Jim's house. Uncle Ben's house would have been here. On my left would have been uh, years before the turn of the century, was Denby's uh, smithy. And away back in the background to my left, you might be able to see, or you mightn't be, uh, Gordon's Hill, the road leading up Gordon's Hill. The water behind me would be possibly uh, 50 feet deep. Petrie, as we have heard, was once called North Pine. No more than a coach stop, it soon became an important centre. In fact, through the 19th century, it was the only town of any note in the region. In 1872, that coach stop became a hostelry when one Edwin Willett gained a publican's licence for the premises. And North Pine became officially a town when a post office opened in the same building. 1877 saw a low bridge built over the North Pine at a point previously impassable after heavy rain or even at high tide. This brought traffic through what we now call Sweeney's Reserve. Later, mounted troopers on gold escort out of Gympie would change horses at the courthouse that opened in 1878. This building, which stood on Old Debra Road, can now be seen at the North Pine Country Park. Towards the turn of the century, the population of the North Pine district had grown to 500. There was considerable controversy amongst those people later, when in 1911 the name of both their railway station and then their postal address changed to Petrie, as a tribute to Tom Petrie, who had died the year before. Debra was first called the Upper North Pine, and then briefly Hamilton. Hugh Hamilton, a farmer, was also the receiving officer for mail. The name Hamilton was changed later to Terrors Creek, after the creek on which the township stood. Terrors Creek, in turn, was named for Terrors Paddock, and Terror, or probably Terra, was a grey stallion owned by Captain John Griffin of the Whiteside Run. But Terrors Creek sounded too much like Torrance Creek, so in 1917 the name became Debra. It might have been called Mackenzie after John Mackenzie, who had operated a pit sawmill here from 1866. But in the end, William Henry Day was acknowledged. He was clerk of Petty Sessions and later police magistrate in Brisbane, and had first selected land in this region in the late 1860s, pioneering sugarcane growing on its large holdings. The failure of these cane crops would later lead to the closing of the fledgling sugar mills, with the land being broken up and developed. North and south along the upper North Pine River, timber, maize, vegetables and dairy products provided income for the settlers on more than 100 selections. The town began, as many did in the 1890s, with a store and a hotel. A sawmill followed in 1901 and the Silverwood Butter Factory and General Store in 1903. The rail then came to Debra, which was described at the time as being set prettily on a hillside and being the centre of miles of agricultural, dairy and fruitlands. This was in 1920, but the rail was closed again in 1955 due to the impact of improved road transport. Strangely, those areas closest to Brisbane, in the secluded valleys of the upper reaches of the South Pine, were not settled until the 1850s. For a while, almost all of what is now the Pine River Shire was taken up by just three runs, Whiteside, Sampsonvale and Samford. In 1854, 
Archibald Young successfully tended for some five square miles of land that he was probably squatting on anyway. This pastoral lease became known as the Samford Run, would change ownership several times and grow to occupy 20 square miles before shrinking again with the advent of closer settlement. There are a number of buildings on the property. The oldest one, probably the oldest in the Sanford Valley, is the uh, building over in my paddock. Um, its boundary on the western end of my paddock. And it was the farmhouse when Grandfather bought the land. The land had been taken up in the um, 1860s, I think, and 70s. The historic Samford cattle station gave its name to Samford Valley, to Samford Road, and to Samford Village, although there was no Samford Village before the Fernie Grove to Dabra Railway in 1918. The construction of the railway station in what is now John Scott Park determined the commercial centre. Excursions to the area by train became very popular among the people of Brisbane. One such outing began at Central Station early in the morning of Labour Day in 1947. They had stopped at Brunswick Street and Mitchelton before the train clambered slowly to the top of the Camp Mountain Knob. Then on its descent, at 15 miles per hour beyond its maximum permissible speed, it left the tracks on a curve and crashed. This was Queensland's worst railway disaster. 16 were dead, 30 others were injured. Thousands of mourners lined the streets for the funeral. Agriculture was important then. Bananas, grown on the steep ridges at the foot of the ranges, were a vital crop by 1908. And servicemen returning from World War I were given a start in the industry on small farms set aside by the government. During 1926 and 1927, more bananas were sent to southern markets from Samford Railway Station than from any other in Queensland. Sadly, success was short-lived. Bunchy top disease, a virus that had already wiped out the banana crops of the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales, travelled north to our river valleys and was the primary reason for the decline of that industry. Today, there are only a few functioning farming properties left in what has become a highly desirable rural residential area. The valley has kept so much of its character. Um, but uh, there's so many of the, the people that have come to live here like it for what it is. And they're not trying to um, enlarge it or spread it about. It's a nice place to live. Launton, named after Stephen Lawn, a farmer, blacksmith and wheelwright, is another locality that had to wait for the rail to arrive before it gained its own identity. Before the North Coast Railway in 1888, it was considered simply a part of the North Pine District. The Launton Cornflower and Starch Mill, established in 1898 by Walter Francis, stood for 90 years near Four Mile Creek and owed its presence there to a series of tests conducted around Brisbane by Mr. Francis. His finding was that the purest water of all came from Four Mile Creek. By the late 1920s, the mill produced between three and four tonnes of corn flour under the brand name Paisley every week. Uh, and the corn flour was known as Paisley corn flour. The word Paisley derived from Scotland. Um, it was a worldwide, well-known area for a good quality corn flour. And so the name Paisley was, was chosen. And it was always known the tag name was Paisley the best corn flour. Um, and I've still got um, a bag with um, the uh, a corn a corn bag with with the um, wording corn f paisley the best corn flour uh, written on it, um, and and the stencil with with paisley the best on it as well. Local maize was produced for corn flour. Walter Francis's sons Herbert and Harold ran the business for some years with one Robert Joyce, who was familiar with the process of extracting corn flour from maize. This business continued into the 1960s 
when Brisbane newspapers began to report that developers were rapidly subdividing dairy farms around Lawton into residential lots. This was to meet a housing boom that saw the local population pass 2,000 by 1969 and more than double that figure just four years later. Strathpine began as simply a farming community. However, when the North Coast Railway stretched to what is now Petrie, a railway station sprang up in the area and had to be named. So, in deference to those many Scots who had arrived in the first wave of settlers, the Railways Department in 1887 took the Scottish word Strath, which means a valley, and coined Strathpine, the Valley of the Pines. The opening of the railway, of course, was a boon for farmers, providing them with far easier access to market. Before the railway, North Pine had been the commercial centre for both the North and South Pine regions, but this was before gold in Gympie. The gold rush brought far greater numbers through the area, and Tom Petrie's twice-a-week Cobb & Co changing station at North Pine grew ever more inadequate, especially when the crossing at Four Mile Creek was in flood. On what is now a portion of the playing fields at the Pine Rivers High School, one James Wallen established a second coach house on the southern side of Four Mile Creek close to the corner of Gympie Road and Buckley Street. These premises were licensed from 1871 and thus became the first hotel in the Pine Rivers area. All that remains of this obviously important site, later closely associated with the pioneering Buckby family, is a large Morton Bay fig tree that once shaded the coach house. In the 1870s, Strathpine's surrounding fields boasted at least three sugar mills. The most successful of these was the Normanby named after the Marquess of Normanby, Governor of Queensland from 1871 to 1874. As did most Queensland mills of the time, the Normanby distilled rum from the sugar mill byproduct molasses. By now, however, the molasses was sourced from other mills outside the region, since sugar farming had fallen out of favour in the Pine Rivers area. Rowan Gardner had his own boat and it was named the Normanby. It was a uh a single uh, shaft, propeller driven, stern driven uh, boat, not a paddle wheel or not a side wheeler. But he would have come up here and turned around and taken, brought rum, uh, molasses up and taken rum back. It seems that Normanby rum was mighty fine rum, achieving as it did the rare distinction of a bronze medal at the Paris International Exposition of 1878. Little wonder that by 1889, the distillery was producing between 300 and 400 gallons of rum each week. All the while, small steamers navigated the South Pine River on the high tide to bring in the molasses and take away the rum. The river flowed on, and the distillery changed hands a few times. In 1911, a branch line would connect it to the North Coast Rail, with horses and bullocks and later tractors hauling wagons across Gimpy Road, near where Westfield Shopping Town now stands down to the distillery on the western bank of the South Pine. Yeah, well, uh, this one particular chap, uh, I think his name was Charlie Hansen, no relation to mine as S-O-N, and, uh, but he uh, was a pretty cruel sort of chap and the bullocks didn't like him. And as soon as they heard his voice, uh, all the bullocks used to start stamping their feet in anticipation of getting a belt across their back, I suppose. But By the late 1920s, Production of rum was over 1,100 gallons per day. The Commonwealth Government was earning 300,000 pounds per annum in excise, and the Bennett family had come to manage the operation. This they did until 1963. Sadly, production from this renowned distillery, by now the longest running in Australia, came to an end in 1968. During 1889, it was the building of what is now known as the Old Shire Hall that determined Strathpine would become the administrative centre of the Pine Divisional Board, later the Pine Shire, and, since 1959, now the Pine Rivers Shire. Before World War I, Strathpine would have its own school, two general stores, one hotel, a butcher, two bakers, two blacksmiths, one saddler, and of course, the Normanby Distillery. Every fortnight, special trains brought crowds from Brisbane to Strathpine's own racecourse, on the western side of the railway opposite the Clyde Hotel. The Clyde Hotel later burned to the ground during the war and allegedly by an American military policeman who had become irritated over a squabble at the bar about our pounds and pence currency.
The district known affectionately as the Hills, Fernie Hills, Arana Hills and Everton Hills, saw the first suburban development in the Pine River Shire in the late 1950s. The essentially rural nature of the Shire had begun to change rapidly during the 60s. The first developer to walk into the Shire was George Wilmore. We had never struck on a developer before. Mr Wilmore's basic discussion was, I will construct the water main from Strathpine to Arana Hills at my cost. I will build you a swimming and an Olympic sized swimming pool in Arana Hills. All I want in return is quick approval to my plans and subdivision. Which he got and he sold his allotments over there for more or less chicken feed. They were five hundred dollars a block. You could buy a real good block of land in Narana Hills at five hundred dollars when he started. Really good land. Around Patrick's Road. And uh, the next uh, the next once once the uh, water supply scheme started, of course, with developers like Bill Bowden, Peter Kurtz, P Bill Bowden at Strathpine, Peter Kurtz at uh, at Petrie, Jimmy Grant at uh, at uh, Kalanga, all came forward with all their ideas. But there were dozens and dozens and dozens of smaller subdividers came into the fray, and were subdividing little tiny paddocks here and there and everywhere. When Wilmore and Randall set up this estate, they um, didn't have a water supply to start off with. They didn't even have to put in roads, apart from the inter interior roads, the out external roads, that's Patrick's Road, Pluck's Road, Park Road and Dawson Parade, they were all gravel. By the early 70s, the Shire's population had exceeded 25,000 and the main industrial area of Brendale had been established. Such areas as Albany Creek, Kalanga and Mango Hill were indelibly marked upon the map of the Pine Rivers Valley. Through the 60s and 70s, when more and more farmlands were being sold to satisfy an insatiable demand for land, much of the commercial and residential development in the Strathpine area was in the hands of one W.H. Bill Bowden. Many will remember Bill Bowden's slogan of these times, throwing out the challenge to the more established surrounding communities. Little Aspley, that's Strathpine. This ongoing urban expansion dramatically changed the economic character of the Shire. The region became a suburban dormitory area, with its people employed mainly in Brisbane. Although the expansion of industrial and commercial development at Brendale and at Strathpine and Lawton has greatly increased the opportunities for local employment, the Shire's economic base grows ever more diversified, the environment ever more modern. I think today we realise that a lot of people love living here. They love the lifestyle, they love the way that we are sort of country on the edge of the city and whereas many of them go into Brisbane to work, they all come home here to live, which is wonderful. Today the Pine River Shire happily retains its character, that unique and mainly rural personality. For all of the progress of these two centuries, there is much that has stayed unchanged. The colour of the landscape, the clear blue skies, the mountains of the lakes and the wide open spaces remain. The rolling hills and the valleys lead to the river still, and the rivers of our story flow on through it all.